Praise the Lord. Would you guys stand this morning as we begin? Hallelujah. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Well, let's try that again. I got, oh, got two amens from the platform and one guy clapped. What a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Yes. Hey, that's better. That's better. Hallelujah. Listen, this morning, you know, the Lord just kind of laid on my heart to let you know that if you came in here just kind of stressed out a little bit, you know, or maybe you're fearful or, or maybe you're just facing adversity, listen, this worship service today is for you, okay? It's for you. God custom designed this just for you because he knew that you were going to be here this morning. Man, you know, Job said, hey, he knows my ways. He knows my going in. He knows my coming out. The Lord has had his eye on you all day, every day, but especially today. So let's just lift our hands right now. And I just want you to allow the peace of God to sweep over you. Just allow it. Listen, peace is not based on circumstances. Are you listening to me today? It's not based on circumstances. God can give you peace in the midst of whatever storm that you are going through. Hallelujah. You see, when the, the, the storm was rocking the boat, Jesus was asleep down below. Why? Because he wasn't worried about anything because he knew that God was in control. And you've got to know that today. You've got to know that God is in control. There is not a reason in the world that you've got to be nervous. We've already read the end of the book. We know who wins. The Bible says, if God be for me, then who can be against me? It doesn't matter what you're going through. I want you to know today that God is for you. God has got you. I have always had just enough faith to believe that not a hair of my head is going to fall to the ground without his permission. Hallelujah. And if he permits it, it is for my own good. Amen. Oh, let's just lift up the Lord right now. Let's welcome him into this place. The Bible says that he inhabits our praises. Hallelujah. He wants our praise to rise so that his glory can descend upon this place today. Jesus, we welcome you. Lord, we just step aside and tell you to have your way in this service. Lord, I pray, God, that you would make the crooked path straight. You would make the rough way smooth in the lives of everybody in here today, God. Oh, Father, I pray that we would come in here and we would exchange what is in our hands for what is in your hands, God. A divine exchange is going to take place in this house today during worship, Father. God, people who have walked in here with fear, Lord, they're going to leave, Father, with power and of love. They're going to leave with a sound mind, God. People who came in here, Father God, anxious or upset, God, they're going to leave with a peace of God that passes all understanding that we get to experience in your presence. Hallelujah. I want to invite anybody who wants to to come forward this morning. Let's worship in this house. Let's give God everything that we've got. You know, he doesn't ask for much. Just a, a few minutes on a Sunday morning out of our week. So he deserves the very best that we have to offer him today. Amen. Could you give the Lord praise this morning as we begin? Just a sitting feet. Cause you are not afraid when the terror scream loud at me. Cause you have overcome, and you have overcome, and you're the God of victory. And I'm dancing on the grave that once held me bound, dancing on the chains that are laying on the ground. I'm dancing out of the dark, lighting up the night, and joy becomes a weapon. I'm here to fight, fight, fight. I'm here to fight, fight, fight. We sing when I walk. When I walk through the valley of the shadow, I will not be there. Cause I know, I know 
you by my side and you'll never leave me by myself Cause even when Oh, and even when I'm weary you are calling me to call my rest hey. Oh, you cannot be stopped You have already defeated hell He cannot be stopped today set you free today come on the enemy may be all around me but i'm running free because you set me free the enemy may be all around me but i'm running free i'm running free oh lord oh i'm free to worship you jesus 
Oh, cause whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Just declare today, just declare today, freedom from every chain, freedom from every stronghold, freedom from sickness, God. Oh, we're free. We're free to worship you, Jesus. Oh, when we can't see the outcome, God will praise you. Oh, in the middle of the storm, we praise you. Oh, in the middle of the chaos, God. Hey. Oh, because the enemy may be around me, but I'm running free. Because you set me free. The enemy may be around me, but I'm running free. Because you set me free. The enemy may be around me, but I'm running free. Cause you set me free. You be around me, but I'm running free. Cause you set me free. You set me free. You set me free. You set me free, and I'm free indeed. You set me free. You set me free. You set me free, and I'm free to worship. You set me free. You set. set me free the enemy may be all around me but i'm running free because you set me free the enemy may be all around me but i'm running free because you set me free the enemy may be all around me but i'm running free come on can we lift him up today come on can we give him worship can we give him all the praise i'm running free god I'm running free, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. I know who I am, because I know who you are. The cross of salvation was only the start. And now that I'm chosen, free and forgiven, we have a future. I have a future, and it's worth the living. Cause I wasn't made to be tending a grave I was called by name Born and raised back to life again I was made for more So why would I make a bed in my shame When a fountain of grace it's running my way, I know I am yours. I was made for more. Come on, do you believe it this morning, church? I know who I am. Cause I know who you are. The cross of salvation. Was
So why would I make a bed in my shame when the fountains of grace is running my way? I know I am yours. I was made for more. I was made for more. Yeah. Hey. Come on, can you just worship him in this moment?
Come on, we join together and sing. He's the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God, anointed one, who was in this and is to come. He's seated on the throne above. Holy, holy, the righteous one who shed his blood to prove to us the Father's love. Jesus Christ, be lived. Sing it out. One and is to come seated on the 
throne above Holy, holy, the righteous one Shed his blood, prove to us Jesus Christ be lifted up. Holy, 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 holy. to be praised Lord you are great and greatly to be praised come on can we just worship him in this moment you are holy you are worthy Jesus worthy Lamb of God there's none more worthy there's none more holy holy yes you are the righteous Lamb of God oh And sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art! How great Thou art! Come on, can you lift your voice today? Then sings. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art, oh yes You are. Oh, how great. 
Father, you are so worthy. Church, can you just tell him for just another moment? We've sang songs about how worthy he is and how holy he is and how great he is. And so I just want to give you just another moment in your own words to just, just pour that out before him today as a, a sacrifice of praise and worship. Father, you are worthy. church as we were singing those songs and we sing about how great the Lord is, how worthy he is and how holy he is. And the song that really caught my attention this morning was a couple songs ago. And there's a line in the song that says, I know who I am because I know who you are. And I'm paraphrasing that. I'm sorry, Tyler, I messed that up. But like, I, I know who I am because I know who my God is. And sometimes we have to remind ourselves how great and how powerful and how mighty God is because it affects the way that we see ourselves, right? And I love that, ver that line in that song that says, I wasn't made to be tending a grave. And I just want to put that over you today and just tell you that the Lord God Almighty did not intend for you to live this life tending a grave. Like that's not what he has in store for you. That is not God's best on your life. And there's probably so many things that we could apply that to in so many ways. But I think that the way that the Lord hit me with that today is, you know, I don't know. Sometimes we just get stuck. Like I'm talking about spiritually. Like sometimes spiritually, it's like we feel like we just get stuck and it's like we're just, we're just there tending this grave. We're just trying to make sure that the spiritual part of us just doesn't die. And I want you to hear me say today that God does not intend for you in your spiritual life to feel like that you're just tending this perpetual grave. Like he intends great and mighty and awesome things for your spiritual life. He intends good things for you. And I want you to hear this morning, the Lord, there's a fountain of grace. It's another line in that song. There's a verse that I want to read over us today. And I, I just want to ask you this. I just want to, right where you are, if you'll just close your eyes for just a second. I'm just going to trust the Lord in this. If you're here this morning and you just feel like, I'm stuck. My spiritual life, I'm just stuck. I just feel like that I've just kind of been tending a grave. And I, listen, I have good news for you this morning. The grace of God is without limit. The power of God is without limit. And what the Lord intends for you, the Lord will see it come to completion. My favorite verses in Scripture, some of them, they, they talk about that the Lord is the one who gives me strength. And so if that's you and you just feel stuck, I just want to ask you to raise your hands right where you are. And I believe that the Lord is going to pour out grace and mercy and power over your life today. I want to read these verses and I want to pray over us. This is Paul's prayer in Ephesians. Especially if your hands are lifted this morning. I just want you to hear these words. For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray, listen, this is a prayer for those of you, for those of us who find ourselves stuck or find ourselves tending a grave or find ourselves kind of stuck in that same place like we can't get out of this rut and move closer and further with the Lord. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you being rooted and established in love, may have 
power together with all of the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with the measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine according to his power. Listen, can we just all together, can you just repeat after, the, repeat after me? His power. His power. His power. Listen, it's not our power. We don't have the ability. It's not our grace. It's, not, it's nothing within us. And I think that if we come to the point that we remember that we know who we are because we know who he is, then the power and the grace and the mercy of God floods our lives. And we, I, I just pray that this morning that the Lord would just hit the turbo in some of our spiritual lives because it's his power. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church of Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. I just want to encourage you this morning. The Lord is strong and mighty. The Lord is able where you are not. The Lord intends great and mighty things in your spiritual life. The Lord wants to see you excel and move beyond what you even think or imagine. And so one more time, if that's you and you just need the Lord to strengthen you, if you find yourself in a rut, if you just find yourself tending a grave, I want to ask you to raise your hands and I'm going to pray over us this morning. Father, we come before you this morning, humble Lord. God, I'm reminded that your word tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 that you give grace to the humble. Lord, you oppose the proud, but you give grace to the humble. And Lord, I have always held on so tightly to that verse because if we humble ourselves, then it is grace upon grace upon grace. And it is power upon power upon power. Lord, you told the disciples in the book of Acts, go and wait until you are clothed with power from on high. Lord, those verses in all of Scripture, they don't sound to me like a group of people who call upon the name of the Lord and spend their time tending a grave. Lord, it sounds to me like a group of people who sell out to you, God, and who as they give their entire hearts to you, Lord, you look upon them and you pour out grace and you pour out power. Lord, I pray today, Father, that you would strengthen us in our spiritual lives, God. Lord, I pray, Father, that we would understand that a little bit of hard work on our part and a whole lot of anointing on your part, and we can accomplish things in this world that we, don't even, uh, we can't even imagine or comprehend yet. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd show us those things. I pray, Father, that you would show us what it is that you have in store for us and that you would give us the power and the grace to be able to step into that, Father. Lord, I pray, Father, over people who have found themselves stuck. Lord, there's so many things that can cause us to be stuck. Lord, we can be stuck because of shame of our past. We can be stuck because of the voice of the enemy. And God, we declare today that we are the people of God and that the Spirit of the Lord God Almighty is dwelling on the inside of us. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would allow your power and your grace, Lord, to be what flows out of us and what en enables us to push forward in all that you have for us. Father, we praise you and we worship you. And I thank you, Lord, that you are meeting with us today and that you are strengthening your people. And we bless your name and we pray that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may be seated. Good morning. Such a sweet presence of the Lord in this place today. I love it. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just need to drink in his presence and his goodness. Amen. 
Well, if you're visiting today, we want to welcome you to First Assembly, and my husband will um, officially do the welcome today, but I just want to say welcome to you. Um, we've got a few announcements that we want to make today, and that's going to take just a couple of minutes, but something brand new that we want to talk about today is our FAM community groups. Um, and yes, there we go, community groups thriving together. Um, it's, you know, you, you guys understand this, that a lot of times when we're in this setting here, like we are this morning, it's almost impossible to say hello to everybody you want to say hello to, right? Um, I feel like I see the same 12 people every Sunday and I love those 12 people, but there's a whole lot more than 12 in the room that I want to see. Um, so what we are going to do, and I know that happens to you guys and, um, we're creatures, real big creatures of habit. How many of you sit in the same seat or the same area every single Sunday? Raise your hand. That's every single body in this room. Yes, we all do. Um, and so we got to know more than who's on our little one or two rows around us. So that is why the Lord has really put on our hearts to um, develop these community groups. And what these groups are, we are going to break them up by age groups. And so um, that way you can get together with people like people your age and maybe have some of the same interest in mind. Or maybe you're in the same situation or the same station in your life. But just for us to have fellowship and get to know each other and get to um, experience life together. Um, and all of these community groups are going to be different. First, let me back up and say this. Um, our intentions are to have one community group a quarter, which is a three-month period. But because everything fell into the first quarter of this year, Easter included, we're going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to have one community group every two months. And so you will hear the announcement. You will see it on Facebook. If you are not in the FAM group, now there is a First Assembly page on Facebook, but there is a FAM group group that you can be a part of where we also make a lot of announcements and a lot of things just throughout the week. So we'd love for you to get in that. But these community groups are going to be broken up. And do we have a slide for our, just like our first group, maybe? There we go. Look at that good looking couple. Jeremy and Allison Hendricks. Okay. So this, this time, Jeremy and Allison um, are going to host the community group for ages 25 to 35. It is going to be on April the 29th at 6 p.m. at the park, Jeremy and Allison. At the park? At the, okay, at the park. Yes, okay, that's what I thought. So, we will have these from time, you know, weekly that will scroll and we'll say, Jeremy and Allison Hendricks, ages 25 to 35, April 29th at 6 p.m. Okay, then next we have, the next group we have is Russ and Jenna Friend, ages 45 to 55. There is a group in there that was, that we missed the 35 to 45, but we're still working on that for this, for this time. Russ and Jana are the 45 to 55 age group. Um, that's what they're hosting this time. And that is May 11th at 4 p.m. It is at the pavilion in their community where they live, and there'll be more information about that coming to you as well. The Neil and Nancy Travis, age 55 to 65, May the 18th at 5.30 p.m. It's going to be at their home. Again, we will give you all the specifics for that. And then last group that we have is Roger and Debbie Stiles will be hosting our senior adults May 4th at 1 p.m. at their home. And Roger says to make sure everybody knows their theme is May the 4th be with you. You got to know Roger to appreciate that. I thought I did pretty good though, Roger. Did I not do pretty good on that? Okay, good. Um, and so all these community groups, um, again, there is an age group, um, 35 to 45, that we have not yet planned that event, but it will be in there as well. So everybody is going to have a group. Now, you say, what if my spouse is 55 and then you're like me, and you go in the 25 to 35 group. What do... April, that was not that funny. Let's pray. 
Okay, so you say, I'm, I, I'm already, I'm mad. Okay, so your spouse is in a 55 group and you're in a 25 group. Thank you very much. Where do we go? You can go anywhere you want to go. You can go in the 25 group with your spouse and then your spouse can go with you into the 55 group. Wherever, or you can do both what, or either whatever you're more comfortable with. We know there's not going to be that huge of an age gap. There may be, but that's okay too. Um, and you'll be that. If you have children... In the community groups, we will let you know for those who have children if your community group will be um, wanting you to bring your kids or not. Some of you will uh, be open to bring your children. Some of the groups may say, hey, would you get a babysitter just because this is going to be a, a fun adults only night and we're not going to have child care. We will not provide child care here at church just because it's just too many days and just a lot of different responsibility and reasons why we will not do that. So if your community group says, we're not going to do kids tonight, call grandma, call a friend, call somebody that can help watch your children. But again, we just believe this is going to be just a great time to build community with one another. I guarantee you, if I had Jacob and Mason, y'all stand up. Y'all stand up right here. Okay. This is Jacob and Mason. Does everybody on this side of church know who Jacob and Mason are? Kind of, sort of. Kind of, sort of, but not really. She's shaking her head. No, we don't. Thank you. You did so well. And, and, that, and that is the purpose in it. We get kind of we get kind of stuck in our little us for and no more, and we want to make sure that we're reaching out, that we're building community. Listen, it's going to be fun groups. Sometimes you'll say, "Hey, we're going to Los Portales. Everybody meet there." Then you come. Other times it's going to be. I know Neil and Nancy said they're going to have like a, a bonfire and a s'mores and fun stuff at their house. Great. Somebody's going to the park. Somebody's doing this. Somebody, you know, it'll be different every single time. And you will not have the same host every time. If you would like to host a group, and when I say host a group, that does not mean you do all the work. You do not pay for everything. You do not provide everything. You're just willing to say, hey, yeah, I'll kind of lead this thing and I'll rally the troops together. If you want to do that and you're willing to do that, please come and see me. We need more people who are willing to do that. Excuse me. Just about swallowed my gum. Um, <clears throat> but, um, and it doesn't have to be for your age group. <clears throat> if you have a heart that says, you know what? <clears throat> I'm 60, but I really want to get to know the 25 to 35-year-olds. Then host that group. Or maybe you're 35 and you like, you know what? I love senior adults. I'd really like to host that group. You're op we're open to do that as well. There are really no... No specifics, um, nothing that you could ask that would be out of the box. But we do ask that you get involved and you be a part of, of that. So our very first group, Tyler, is what date? The 29th. And who is that? Jeremy and Allison. Okay, Tyler's worked all, so mu much on this with me. So the first group will be the 25 to 35 age group on April 29th at 6 p.m., at the park. So if you will, Jeremy and Allison, y'all stand up. Everybody sees your picture, but you stand up. Stand up and let everybody see how pretty you are. And so if you're in the age group of 25 to 35, you need to connect with Jeremy and Allison. You need to say, hey, what do I need to bring? They're going to have a list. They're going to call you. They're going to reach out to you. They're going to say, bring potato chips, bring drinks, bring hot dog buns, whatever they ask you to bring. And you'll just come and be a part together. But we just want to provide a way other than being here at church and fellowshipping here together at church, we want to provide a way for us just to get to know each other and just to be a blessing to one another. So join our community groups. We're super excited about it, and we know God has great things planned. I just want to tag just a little bit on the community groups uh, really quick. We can't stress the importance enough on being in the fam group 
uh, that we have here on Facebook. So you need to be on that group because we're going to be posting signups. You might want to sign up today where you can find one of the, the leaders of the group today. And they're going to have a QR code that you can scan and go. We love QR codes at FAM. I love QR codes. They're on everything. So you can scan it. You can go to the signups and you can pick your group. That just gives us uh, a number of who's going to be attending what group. It's going to give us your, your phone number and different things. So it just helps us keep everything nice and organized. So see one of the leaders today. They have the QR code you can scan. We're also going to be posting this week in the FAM group where you can do all of that. So moving on, we have Meet the Pastors. We have Meet the Pastors on Sunday, April 29th, directly after service. So what this is, is this is another way, if you're visiting, you've been coming for a while, maybe you, maybe we have visitors that day who just want to say, hey, I want to meet the pastors. Well, we're, you're going to get a chance to do that. You're going to get to do that in the conference room following service. You're going to get to meet Pastor, Pastors Rick and Tammy, Pastors Kevin and Micah, uh, myself and Abby, and just to hold the whole staff to kind of get to know them because it can be really hard on a Sunday morning uh, to be able to meet us just because Things are so chaotic on Sunday mornings, and we, we're so, you know, everything that we do here on Sunday morning is such a, uh, is a big deal, and a lot goes into it. So, so Sunday, April 29th, immediately following the service, meet the pastors. We have, what did I say? It's 28th. I have 29th in my notes. Thank you, guys. Thank you. See, so you know what, Pastor Tammy, she sprung this on me last minute, said, you're going to get up there and do these announcements. And I said, I haven't had any time to, like, write anything down. So I'm over there after worship writing down my dates and stuff. You think I did the graphic, you know, I'd be able to remember the date, but there's, there's not a QR code on it. So I guess, <laughs> right. <laughs> but anyway, uh, moving on, Fusion Kids sign-ups. They're available outside in the foyer and in kids' check-in. So right out here in the foyer, you can sign up for your child to go to Fusion Kids. This is Fusion Kids. This is not Fusion Youth. We already have our sign-ups for Fusion Youth. If your student wants to go there, they can still sign up for that as well. But Fusion Kids, sign up today in the foyer and in kids' check-in. And also the $50 deposit is due for that as well. So you need to be getting that to Pastor Tamley. Pastor Tammy, at some point today or this week, also the $50 deposit is due for uh, Fusion, uh, Fusion Youth as well. So Fusion Kids sign up today, available in the foyer and a kids check-in. And then we have the Fusion Yard Sale and Car Wash. Who's ready for some yard sale and car wash? <laughs> We had an incredible time last year. We, we, we raised a ton of money in the yard sale, in the car wash for, for people to be able to go to camp and things like summer ramp. So we need your help. So like if you have a bunch of stuff that you want to sell, you can either donate or you can come and set up a table in the yard sale and, and sell your items. for And just a small uh, percentage of your proceeds will go to, go to the youth. But we say it every year. Please, if you're donating, please don't give us junk. Like, don't give us something that you were about to take to, like, you know, about to sit on the side of the road and, and try, yeah, <laughs> try to sit on the side of the road and try to, uh, you know, bring it up here and sell. Because after we don't sell it, it usually goes to the mustard seed or the trash. So, so yeah, if you donate stuff, donate us good stuff, things that you think has a chance of, uh, you know, selling that day. We have a car wash. Come get your car wash. You know, we have uh, all the students out there. They're going to be out there. Hopefully, they will uh, leave your car in better shape than when you brought it. <laughs> but uh, we'll see. We got plans for that. I also want to add anybody can sell at FAM in the, in the yard cell. So it doesn't have to just be like a, a student or a parent of a student. Like if you got some stuff to sell, get with me. I'll, I'll get you a table assigned. And uh, yeah, I'm just excited uh, for Saturday, May 11th. So thank you. Yeah. I'm just not really sure about how we did it today, if that's ever going to work again. I mean, think about it, because Tammy has got me going to her to the 25-year-old thing at Jeremy's, and I'm going to have to drag her to Roger and Debbie's. <laughs> I mean, that's the way I'm reading it, you know? 
Maybe we could get that Northwest Tennessee transport van to drop us off. I'm sure they know where Roger lives. <laughs> and I have a couple of more observations. Do y'all want to hear them? Well, you're going to anyway. I've got the microphone. Sorry. I saw some people last year at the car wash when they saw us washing cars get out of line. <laughs> they came by and gave us $20 not to wash their car. <laughs> but like, you know, I've never worked at a detail shop, but I really don't think that's right. <laughs> and one more thing, we have received stuff at the yard sale before that mustard seed wouldn't even take. <laughs> I mean, so anyway, hallelujah, ushers come forward. <laughs> Let's change the order of the service here. Hey, do we have anybody this morning, first time you've been at First Assembly, or it's been a long time since you've been here? Listen, don't be, don't be reticent to raise your hand because we are so glad you're here, and we love you if you're visiting. And if you're visiting, we know that you're looking for something. You're looking for maybe a church, and I just want you to know that if you're visiting, our church is looking for you too. Amen, church? If you're visiting, lift your hand, everybody. Anybody visiting, lift it high. Hi, look, we have some visitors right here. I loved watching you guys worship, by the way. I was like looking over there, and I was like, man, who are those guys? You know, I mean, they're worshiping the Lord. We have the uh, we have Tyler's infamous QR code. If you want to shine, if you want to uh, point, not shine your phone, point your phone at that and take a picture. And we have some right here holding the beautiful baby. Raise your hands again if you guys will. Anybody else visiting? As I'm perusing on around, Kara, you're not visiting. Anybody else visiting? We're pointing at somebody. Uh, okay, yeah. Hey, listen, our, our people will point you out if you don't raise your hand. They'll stand up and do this, you know. They're bad about that. Listen, we are so, so very glad that you are here, and we hope that you feel at home here because we are a family, and we love you, and we are so glad that our paths cross today. Church, can we give our visitors a hand this morning? Church, thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I want to encourage you to give to the Lord this morning. Man, God is faithful. God, God has big plans for our church. I'm just so excited about everything that I'm seeing him do. I'm excited about what he's been doing in me. I'm excited about what he's been doing in you. I'm excited about what he's doing in our church. Take your gift and hold it to the Lord this morning. Father, as your people give, I pray that you would bless them according to the measure of their faith. I pray, God, that you would increase their faith. And, Lord, I know that achieving an increase in faith isn't always easy, but God, it's the currency of heaven. Lord, we put so much emphasis here, God, on trying to make money and trying, Lord, to save up for our retirement, God, when in reality, faith is the currency of eternity, Lord. It's the thing, God, that will allow us to lay up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. Father God, thieves do not steal. God, everything we have ultimately belongs to you. We are a steward at best. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you for not just being Jehovah Jireh, but for being our Jehovah Jireh. We love you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you bring your gift forward this morning in an act of worship? Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. Thank you, ushers. So before Easter, I, I began a, a series within a series. How many of you remember our series where we talked about inviting people to church, inviting people to share their faith, share the gospel, spread the good news? And the mini-series that we started is, was based on two significant statements that Jesus made while he was on the earth and both deserve to be revisited time and time again. Today's going to be my last sermon in that particular series, but we will revisit this subject on a regular basis, and I will constantly 
remind you of why I preached this series to begin with. Let's look at the two significant statements that Jesus made, beginning with Luke chapter 2, verse 49, where he said, Why do you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And the next one is in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, where he said, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. We can derive from these two statements that the Father's business has to do with seeking and saving the lost. Amen? And if we indeed consider ourselves Christians, we must live up to that billing because the word Christian means Christ-like. So if we're truly going to be like Christ, then we need to go to work in the family business and seek out the loss in order to see them saved. If we are part of the family of God and we want to go to work in the family business, which is what we want to do, amen, to be about the Father's business, to be about the business of heaven, then we want to do this. Okay, so we're going to have a little bit of fun with the title of the sermon today. I want to give you a little history about the title of today's sermon. And this may just, this, this whole thing may totally tank, but it's okay because we tank the announcements. It's all right. So, uh, John Boy and Billy. How many of you have ever heard of John Boy and Billy? Hey, I'm surprised, man. We got some cool people in here, you know. Babe, have you ever heard of John Boy and Billy? <laughs> She's not answering me. Is okay, so... John Moore and Billy are from our hometown. They're uh, actually, uh, they're from the Charlotte area. Billy actually went to the same high school that I did. We graduated from the same high school. I didn't know him, but he is, uh, he's a few years older than I am. And I wanted to have a little fun with this sermon title because sermon titles are a challenge. I mean, you would think, you know, I mean, seriously, I always try to put a lot of thought into my sermon titles because you want the title to be catchy. And man, when you preach hundreds, hundreds of sermons after a while, you know, you're like, man, you know, I'm, it's just like I'm fresh out of ideas. And a lot of times I'll have the sermon completely uh, done and won't have a title for the sermon. And I know it, it kind of aggravates Tyler, but man, it's, it gets tough sometimes to come up with these. But um, so John Boy and Billy do what's called the big show, and they do all these little skits, and they, they feature these different people that do funny things. And at the end of the skits, and if you've ever listened to them, you've probably heard this before, at the end of the skits, uh, Billy does this uh, one-liner, and he says, are we ready? He says, join us next time when you hear the crusty old Let cash. Let me hold it out. All right, let's try it one more time. Okay, join us next time when you hear the crusty old cashier say, Hey, big man, let me hold it out. See there, it wasn't that good. Okay, so hey, big man, let me hold a dollar. That's the title of the sermon today, and it's going to make sense in a minute. So let's go to Luke chapter 15, and as you're going there, let me preface this with the fact that Jesus in this chapter uses three parabolic stories that were intended to show the Pharisees the purpose of the gospel and the true value of one who is lost, which is something that the modern-day church needs to truly understand as well. And I'm not going to stand here and say to you that the modern-day church doesn't care about souls, but the Bible says that wisdom is proved right by her actions. How much emphasis does the modern-day church really put on evangelism? How much emphasis does the modern-day church really put on seeing somebody come to Christ? How much time do we spend inviting people to church? You see, if we aren't careful, we can get so engulfed in the church world and in church politics and in church drama. Come on, somebody. Am I in the right place today? That we forget about the main objective, and that is to see people come into right relationship with Christ. You know, Alex and Tyler, since they started pastoring, they have both said to me, uh, you know, Dad, why did you not tell us that Sundays come around so quickly? You have to have a sermon and then another sermon and then another sermon. And, man, it just, like, clicks off. It's like you spend so much time on sermons. And, and, and I said to them, you know, guys, in, in all honesty, a pastor's thoughts can never be far from a sermon. Amen? It can't. It can't. 
Right, Tyler? Right, Kevin? Your, your mind can never be too far away from a sermon, even in youth ministry or, or other ministries, you know? And, and, and as believers, listen to me, I believe that our minds should never stray far from the, the fact that people need Jesus. That's something that we should always be mindful of. That's something that should always be in your heart and be in your mind. I mean, think about it. There are things that are never out of your thoughts. Your kids are never out of your thoughts, are they? Your grandkids are never out of your thoughts. Your business, businessmen, is never out of your thoughts. If you're a coach, your players are never out of your thoughts. If you're a teacher, your students are never out of your thoughts. And the list goes on. And as believers, the law should never be out of our thoughts. It was never out of Jesus' thoughts. Many times when someone would come forward to be healed, Jesus would look at them and he would say, your sins are forgiven. Why did he do that? Because that was the primary order of business. That meant more than somebody being healed. It meant more than blinded eyes being open. Man, we get all caught up if, you know, if somebody, if a blind person can see or a lame person can walk or somebody gets healed of leprosy, you know, or God heals somebody uh, of a terminal illness. But the main thing should be for Jesus to give them eternal life, for their sins to be forgiven. That, should, that was the main thing on Jesus' agenda. It should be the main thing on our agenda today. It should never be far. Okay, so let's go to Luke chapter 15. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. Luke chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. Everybody say muttered. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Somebody ought to highlight that in their Bible. We think the gospel and we think church is all about us. He settled it right here, did he not? What he said was there's more rejoicing in heaven over one person who does not know him that comes home than hundreds of people in here this morning. I don't think y'all are getting this. I'm going to keep preaching it till you do and it's already 1130. You better hurry up and get it. There is more rejoicing going on in heaven over one person that is unrighteous who comes forward and gives his heart to Jesus than all of the religious righteous people sitting all over this country today, according to the word of God. There you go. You guys want to leave, don't you? Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp? Sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I'll tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So the story begins with the tax collectors and sinners all gathering around to see Jesus. I find it interesting that the narrative starts out with this in this particular way. Luke, the doctor, notices. He's very detailed in his writing. He notices everything that goes on, and he says that the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around because they wanted to see Jesus. The tax collectors and sinners were rejected by the religious people of that day. I want that to be clear. They were considered rejects. They were definitely not accepted in the church world. As a matter of fact, if you showed up with a group of them to service, then you could have very well been asked to leave at that point in time. If you showed up with this particular group of people. But listen to me, the gospel is not designed to drive people away. It's designed to draw people to us. I asked them to put this on the screen. The 
gospel of Jesus Christ should endear people to us, not drive people away from us. Amen? The gospel should endear people to us. It should make people want to be around us. Jesus did it right. People wanted to be around Jesus. It doesn't, didn't matter what their history was. It didn't matter where they came from. Our message today should be a message of love and forgiveness. The Bible says it's his kindness that draws us to repentance. It's not his meanness. It's not his threats. It's his kindness. Jesus talked about heaven twice as much as he did about hell. He wasn't trying to scare people into salvation. He wasn't trying to scare them into the kingdom. He was trying to love them into the kingdom. Are you hearing my heart this morning? He loved the people that were rejected in that era. He loves the people who are rejected now. This passage illuminates the heart of Jesus so that we can see he loved the lost. And I wonder how many of God's people really love the lost. We're real quick to get mad at the lost because maybe the way they talk in front of us or maybe the way that they act. I tell people all the time, listen, you don't get mad at a blind man for being blind. You can't get mad at a sinner for sinning. That's what they do. That's why they're sinners. Amen? They're sinners because they sin. Jesus was passionate for the lost. He loved being around them. You can say amen if you want to. He loved being around the lost. He loved hanging out with them. He loved eating with them. He never tried to avoid them. He never tried to avoid lost people. He, if he showed up today, he wouldn't come and try to find the, the pastor of the biggest church in this town or the biggest church in our denomination. That's not who he'd be going to hang out with. You know, we think we, we, we've got Jesus figured out. You don't have Jesus figured out. Go ahead and put that in your pipe and smoke it. We do not have him figured out. He never tried to avoid the unwanted. He never tried to avoid homosexuals. He loved them. He didn't condemn the adulteress and look down on her. He loved her. Listen to me, he never, ever got angry or upset with the sinner. He never condemned a sinner in the Bible. Look it up. He didn't condemn sinners. It's not what he did. How about us? How do we stack up against that? How many of us love sinners so much that they're attracted to us and they want to be around us? How many of us, and I'm not saying that they want to be around you because you do the same thing they do. I'm saying how many of them want to be around you even though you do have a standard, even though you do have character and integrity, even though you do live by the word of God. The truth is that you should want to be around the lowest of the low, the vilest of the vile, because if you don't, you are like, in a, you are like a group in the Bible that Jesus did get upset with, and that's the religious, the Pharisees. Let's look at verse 2. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered. Everybody say muttered. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So here you've got the religious muttering to one another, moaning, groaning, seeing how he welcomes sinners and and, and, and he eats with them. Did you see who he's with? Did you see who he's hanging around with? How can he hang around with those people and call himself a Christian? Luke didn't write that in there, but I guarantee you that's what they were saying to one another. That was their attitude. That's how they were looking at it, the people that he was hanging with. And we're talking about the church leaders of that day. That's who we're talking about. We're talking about the pastors, the priests, the board members, the leadership. That's who we're talking about right there, you know. And truthfully, not a lot's changed. Let's be honest about it. The religious have become the face of the church. Religion has ruined many more mainline Protestant denominations than pastors falling into sin or stealing or whatever you want to say. They, 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 they've ruined, you know, moral failures, legal problems. You know, I hear horror stories from, from other pastors, and I find myself thinking, and I, I really do, I think this. I look at some people talking to me, and I'm thinking, man, I wouldn't pastor your church for 10 minutes. I'd go be a greeter at Walmart. I'd go do something. You know, if I had to put up with all the stuff that you put up. I mean, you know, but let me say this. I'm so thankful for you guys, fam. Now, I know that some of you still talk about me. (laughs) 
I'm not stupid. And believe it or not, some of those people that you talk to, they talk too. I know there's still whispers, <laughs> which is the meaning of the word mutter, by the way. It's when you say something under your breath to somebody, you know, you're, you're kind of muttering. Did you see that? Did you see what he had on? Did you see what she had on? Did you see Pastor Rick doing 50 through town? That red Jeep of his came off the ground when he hit the railroad tracks. And Alan Alexander and Dominique didn't pull him over because they know him. If I went one mile an hour over, I'd be locked up and in jail. Thanks, Alan, by the way. Alan did pull me over one time. I was in the church van. That's before he started going to church here. He didn't give me a ticket either, by the way. Thanks, Alan. I love you, man. I owe you. If you ever need a prayer, I'm your man. <laughs> you know, something that I've discovered about the religious, the, about religious people by, by and large is they're not worried about the lost. You want to know if you're religious or not? Ask yourself how concerned you are with the lost. And I'm not talking about the lost that live in your household. And I'm not talking about the lost in your bloodline. I'm talking about the lost. I'm talking about people that you're going to come into contact with today that you've never seen before. But you know they need Jesus. Listen to my heart. We need to be concerned about them. We need to worry about them. Because when we're not, that's in total contrast to Jesus who said, I've come to seek and to save those who are lost. Those are action words. You're called to much more than just to come out here and get a spiritual fix once a week. You're called to so much more than that. You are. So Jesus tells them three parables here in Luke chapter 15, trying to explain to them the value of someone who walks away from God. He talked about the lost sheep. He talked about the lost coins. And he talked about the lost son. And today's sermon is about the lost coin. Hence, hey, big man, let me hold a dollar. You know, big man, God's the big, never mind. First off, let's look at the lost sheep. We're going to look at the other two real, real brief right quick. I'm not going to preach long, I promise. Look at the lost sheep. It isn't unusual in the natural for a sheep to wander off and get lost and that a shepherd would go and look for the lost sheep. No animal strays more easily than a sheep and no animal is any more incapable of finding its way back to the flock than the sheep. Therefore, the lost sheep could never save himself or be able to find the shepherd or the flock again. If the shepherd did not spring into action immediately, the sheep would be lost forever. So essentially, Jesus introduces something new to the people of that day whose teaching up to that point had come only from the Pharisees. And Jesus, through this parable, taught them that God actively searches for the lost. God actively seeks for the lost. And how does God do that? Through us, we are his hands extended. That's who we are. So if we're not doing it, it is not being done. And he not only receives the lost, he searches for them. He searches for and finds the sinner. And although that's awesome, that's not even the main point of this parable. It's not even the main point that Jesus was trying to make. The emphasis in this parable was the joy of finding the lost. Think about that. There should be a joy associated with finding the lost. Look at verse 5. And when he finds it, he joyfully, everybody say joyfully, puts it on his shoulders and goes home and watch. Watch what he does. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Let's move on to the son. Same with the prodigal, which begins in verse 11. When the lost boy comes home, the father says, hey, bring me a robe, bring me some sandals, bring me a ring, grill up some fillets, let's have a party. Now, if y'all mess with me, youth, I'm going to dance again like I did last week during Alabama. I know y'all been circulating that around to one another. Or, or, or is it the adults that's been doing that? 
Oh, y'all pointing at the guilty party? Kenzie McKegg. Okay, girl. Listen to me. Do you want to know why so many churches are dead? Because they don't have a reason to party. Can I get an amen in here? But let me tell you something. Having a great worship leader and worship team and worship band is not all that requires you to, or, or is not all that constitutes a party. Amen? We can have a party when somebody that is lost comes home. Listen, we throw, we throw parties for everything in this day and time. Birthdays and weddings and anniversaries and retirements and graduations and gender reveal. How about one for the lost sheep returning to the flock or a prodigal returning to the father's house today? You want to have a real party? That's a reason to party this morning when that takes place. That will raise excitement in a place is what that will do. Hallelujah. You want a reason to celebrate? Let's bring some lost sheep and prodigals up in this house. Amen. All right, so let's look at verse 8. And this is the main focus of what I came to tell you today. Verse 8 says, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one suppose that she has 10 silver coins and she loses one first off i want us to look at the woman in this story the woman in this story was a bride who had been given those coins for a wedding gift that's who she was and therefore she had a responsibility where the coins were concerned and according to this passage she had lost one of the coins and she knew that it was her responsibility she was responsible for that coin and she had lost that coin and the woman also in this story represents you and I the church the church is what is is what is represented Presented in this parable by the woman. So we are the woman in this story. Now, I'd like to point out that the Bible doesn't say how she lost the coin. It doesn't discuss the events leading up to her losing the coin. But what it does tell us is what she did just as soon as she realized that she had lost a coin. She sprung into action immediately. The Bible says, doesn't she, back to the same scripture, light a lamp? sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. One of our main responsibilities as the church is for those who are lost. Now listen to me. The woman in the story didn't sit in the corner and pray. All right? She didn't call the church office and put her coin on the prayer list. Amen? That's not what she did. She didn't say, please pray for the lost coin. She didn't make a Facebook post that said, oh, I need some people that, you know, when you get done at the bar Saturday night to pray for my lost coin on Sunday morning. She didn't say that. She didn't need you to send her a praying hands emoji. She didn't need any of that. Oh, please pray for my lost coin. It's lost. I need somebody to help me pray right now. And don't you love this? Drop everything you're doing and, and pray. No details, no questions, please. What? Pray for yourself, bro. Listen, she lit a lamp. She swept the house. She got busy, didn't she? She went to work. Read it. She went to work. When do we feel like we can come in here and sit down and do nothing and never work for the kingdom of God? Show me what Bible that's in. I'd like to see it. You're not going to find it in there. She went to work. She searched carefully, and she didn't stop until she found it. That was her resolve, and it ought to be ours. Am I in the right house today? I can't get no help in here this morning. I said that was her resolve. She lit a lamp. She got a broom. She swept the house. She shined a light. She didn't stop until she found what was lost. Am I in the right house today? All right, let's consider the coin. The coin in, the, the coin in this story represents the soul. Remember, the woman is the church. That's us. And the coin represents a lost soul. And we established right up front that the coin was lost. Now, Jesus shared two other parables in this chapter with all three referencing something that was lost. But there is a distinct difference, and I'm just about done, but hear my heart. There is a distinct difference between this parable and the coin, this, this parable about the coin and the other two parables. You see, the lost sheep 
and the lost son willfully walked away. Both of them, of their own accord, willfully walked away. The, the, the sheep, you know, they, 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 he walked away from the flock, and the lost son walked away from the father's house. They made a choice to leave. They were responsible for their own actions with eyes wide open. They left the comfort and safety of the fold in the house, and they decided that they were going to take their chances on their own. The coin, on the other hand, Listen to me, was lost by the one responsible for it. And who is that? That was us. We're the woman in the story. The coin was lost. How many people have we lost over the years, church? People who were entrusted to us as a church, people that we were responsible for. The coin represents someone who is here or who should be here but is now lost. And again, we are responsible. The church has driven so many people away. The church in this day and time couldn't be any further from discipleship because let me tell you the message that, that every church I know of is putting out there. This is the message that they're putting out. If you want to be part of this church, then this is how it works. This is an unwritten principle in the church world that I'm fixing to share with you, but it nevertheless, it is a principle. Believe like me so you can become like me, and then you'll belong to me. That's how the church does things. Believe like me, become like me, and then you can belong to me. But you know what Jesus says? Jesus says, belong to me, and then you'll become like me. Wow, think about that. Belong to me. I'll take you just like you are. You don't have to believe like me. You don't even have to be like me. You can belong to me. You can belong to me. Hallelujah. There was another distinct difference between the coin, the sheep, and the son, and it's this. The coin was powerless to do anything about its situation. You see, the sheep, was mobile. The sheep could have gone back home if he could have found his way. The son did go back home. It had the ability to do something about a situation, but the coin was powerless. It didn't wander off. It didn't willingly walk away. It was lost. It had no way, no ability to get back to its owner. The coin could not come back. It had to be found. Are you with me this morning? It had to be found. And one could ask, while the hoopla over one coin, she still had nine. Well, Jesus had already answered that in the first parable when he said the shepherd left the 99 to go after the one. How important to Jesus was the one? How important should the one be to us? This one coin was valuable. And the reason that it was so valuable is because it represented a soul. It represented someone and according to Jesus, one soul is more valuable than the entire world. Just one. This parable, this story is compelling on so many levels. And it begs the question of where did this concept of waiting on the lost to flock to our churches come from? When did we adopt that mindset in the church that we're going to pray for God to send them in? Listen, you can sit at home all day long and say, God, I'm praying for you to give me a job, but I bet you $1,000 if you go out and fill out some job applications, you're going to have better luck. That's just fundamental truth 101 is all that is. We can pray for God to send people in here, but I can promise you if we go out and bring them in here, you're going to have a whole lot more luck getting them in here. Amen. Amen. This woman lit a lamp. She went to where the coin was. She didn't sit in an easy chair and wait on the coin to come back to her. She didn't have the attitude, oh, well, I'll find it when I clean, or the cleaning lady comes on Thursday and she'll find it, or I guess the coin wasn't supposed to be here in the first place, or how about the coin never really became a part of us, or I love this one, the coin's conversion wasn't authentic. Pastor Tyler, 
I close with this. The shepherd in this story went out and found the lost sheep. The father in this story ran and met the lost son. The woman in this story lit a lamp, got a broom, and did not stop until the coin was found. And I must ask this morning, is this our resolve? How much does it mean to us, church? How much it, ask yourself the question, how much does it really mean to me? How much does it mean? Is our resolve that going to be that no matter what the cause, we're going to actively seek and search for the lost, no matter how inconvenient it is, no matter if it interrupts our plans, if it interrupts our life. I want you to consider something. Consider the fact that God's accounting system is not like ours. I want you to consider that this morning. The Bible says that he is not willing that any should perish. It's written in his word. He's not willing to lose anybody. That's why the one is so important. There's a movie that came out several years back called The Guardian. It's starring Kevin Costner and Ashton Kutcher, and it's a great movie. I love the movie. And in the movie, Kevin Costner plays a guy named Ben Randall, and, and Ben Randall is this, uh, he, he's this celebrated Coast Guard rescue diver. When ships are broken down or sinking and people are in the water, this guy will jump out of a helicopter and he will go in and he'll help them get to the basket. And I mean, this guy is just, he, he's famous and, and everybody knows who he is and, and he's rescued hundreds of people. And Ashton Kutcher plays this young hotshot named Jake Fisher and, and, and he comes onto the scene and he's won all these high school swimming awards and he wants to join the Coast Guard and his only goal is to break Ben Randall's record of rescues. That's his goal. He, he, he lives to do that and he's, he's continually asking, you know, he's, he's continually asking Ben, you know, what's your number? How many people have you rescued? How many people have you saved? As if to say, I'm going to break your record. I'm going to save more than you. And as the movie's coming to an end, and the weather's horrible, and they're in dire straits, and most likely neither one of them are going to make it out of this last rescue. And again, all these rumors are floating around about how many people that Ben Randall has saved. And so they're together. And Jake feels like if I ask him what his number is right now, he'll tell me because he knows one or both of us is probably not going to make it out of this. And they're in the water and the storm is raging around them. And Jake looks at him and says, what's your real number? And Ben Randall says, 22. 22. And Jake Fisher says, 22? He says, well, that, that's not bad. It's not 200, but... And then Ben interrupts him and says, 22 is the number of people I lost. He said, it's all I kept track of. I didn't keep track of the ones I saved. I kept track of the ones I lost. And I wonder which number is God keeping track of? Would you stand this morning? I was in here praying yesterday. And I pray this prayer a lot. I do. 
I said, God, I, I don't want to miss it. Whatever your plan is for me, I, I, I don't want to miss it. I, I don't want to fall short. I, I don't want to stand before you and see what you really wanted me to, to do and see. I, Lord, whatever it takes for me to stay on track and to genuinely do what you call me to do, that's what I want, God. That's what I want. And I just thought of the song, Pastor Tyler, that we introduced this morning. I was made for more. Would you bow your heads? And I want to ask you a question this morning. Are you really doing everything that you were made for? Are you accomplishing everything that you were made for? Or could you lift your hands and say, you know what? I believe I was made for more than I'm doing. If that's you, would you lift your hand? My hand's up with you. Because let me tell you something, there's always more. There's always more, church. If your shadow is not healing the sick, there's more. If your prayers aren't seeing blind eyes open, there's more. And if you don't have a heart that breaks for the lost, there's more. Father, there is a song that Tammy and I heard years ago. And there's one line in that song that we've always loved and that we always quote and that we always pray. And it's this, break our hearts for what breaks yours. Break our hearts for the lost, God. Let us see them as you see them, Lord. It's, it's not convenient to be brokenhearted, God. It's not convenient to have a burden for the lost, God. I know that. It's not fun. It interrupts our lives and interrupts our plans and it interrupts our prayer life. But God, I've always said that we make time for the things that are important to us. So Lord, I ask that you would do that for us right now, God. You would break our hearts, Lord, for what breaks yours. And with our heads still bowed, I want to ask a question this morning. Maybe, maybe you're the lost sheep. Maybe you're the lost son, the prodigal. Maybe you're the lost coin, and you're with us today. And God brought you here. And I want to ask you, if that's you, and you'd say, you know what, I need to return to the fold. I need to return to the house. I need to be found. If that's you, would you lift your hand? God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. Anybody else? God bless you. God, listen, do me a favor. If somebody beside you lifted their hand, bring them up here to the altar, would you? Come to the altar. If you lifted your hand, come on up, guys. Don't hesitate. Come on up. Come on up here. Can I have some people pray with them? Wes, if you want to turn us on that uh, a track, that's fine. Pastor Tyler, if you want to come down here and pray, I want you to do that. Just pray with them, church. Begin to pray where you're at. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Turn on Made for More, uh, Wes, would you please? Just turn on. He's a step ahead of us. I know who I am. Made for More, church. And if you're standing out there, I want you to begin to pray that God would break your heart for the lost. 
How wonderful is it that he would bring his spirit down into this church today and break our hearts for what breaks his to allow us to share. And, you know, when the Bible talks about sharing in the fellowship of his suffering, he suffers for the lost. Do you understand that? While we go about our daily life and enjoy everything we can and try to get the most out of stuff, he suffers. Because there are lost people and lost sheep and lost coins that have no way to come back to us, come back to him. That's got to be so difficult. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. Listen to me right quick. You know, that scripture says that there's rejoicing in the presence of angels. A lot of people misquote that, in my opinion. They say the angels rejoice when someone's saved, but I don't think the angels do rejoice because the Bible says that the, the angels marvel at the wonder of salvation. They don't know what it's like to be saved. So when you do know what it's like to be saved, you have a reason to rejoice when somebody comes up front to be saved. So right now, here at First Assembly Milan on April the 14th, 2024, I will want us to raise up a shout and a hand clap for the people who have come forward this morning to give their hearts to Jesus. Come on, church. Hey, come on. Come on. Yes. Hallelujah. Listen, God bless you guys. I love you. And, and let me say this. Prayer tonight. I don't know what's going to happen in prayer tonight, but it's going to be something good. I just, you know, sometimes I tell you, come Sunday, I don't know what I'm preaching, but it's going to be good. I hope it has been good. Tonight, I don't know what's going to happen, but it's going to be good. So come to prayer tonight, 6 o'clock, right here in the main sanctuary. Uh, if you need a healing in your body, come tonight. We're going to pray for the sick. We're going to pray for about anything we can think of. We're going to pray for Israel tonight. We're going to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. The Bible instructs us to do that. Listen, God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord. I'll see you back here tonight at 6.